Haikei, a novel by Vaishnavi Patel. Part 1 I was born on the full moon under an auspicious constellation, the holiest of positions. Much good it did me. In Bharat, where the gods regularly responded to prayers and meddled in mortal affairs, the circumstances of my birth held great promise. This did not matter to my father, who cared only that my brother Yudajit followed me into the world minutes later under the same lucky stars. Regardless of birth position, Yudajit being a boy was the heir to the Kekaya kingdom. I was but a dowry of 59, 50 fine horses waiting to happen. For each of my mother's subsequent pregnancies, my father made sacrifices to the gods requesting sons. In return, he was blessed with six more healthy boys, portents of future prosperity. The people of Bharat have often blamed my father for my sins, as if a woman cannot own her actions. He was not a perfect man, that I freely admit. But for all his faults, he loved each of his sons fiercely, playing with them in his throne room, bringing them the finest tutors in all the kingdom and gifting them ponies so they would grow into brilliant cavalrymen. If he bears any fault for my actions, it is through his inaction. I remember few occasions when we exchanged words and fewer still when he sought to speak with me. Save one. My brothers and I were playing hide and seek in the sweeping field behind the palace and it was my turn to find them. I kept my eyes shut as their laughter faded into wind, opening them only after counting to twenty. I immediately saw a glimmer of movement by the stables. I crept slowly toward whichever brother was hiding there, knowing that they would get more nervous by the second and planning how best to catch them. I doubted it was Mohan, who was three years younger than me. He was short and slow and I knew I could easily grab him. Shantanu was a bit older and was fast as a deer, but I could try to trap him by chasing him towards the palace wall. If it was Yudajit, he may be almost impossible to catch. Though maybe, Shantanu stumbled out from behind the stable. With a whoop, I began sprinting towards him, my blood racing through my veins. But as I followed him past the side of the building, I stopped short. Had I just seen movement? I whirled around to find Yudajit pressed against the wood and my face split into a wild grin. He must have shoved Shantanu out of their mutual hiding spot to distract me. I spun, chasing Yudajit round the stable, knowing as I did that I could never beat him in an outright foot race. He rounded the corner out of sight and from just beyond the wall came a strangled shout. A second later, my shin collided with bony flesh and I fell onto a tangled heap of bodies. Yudajit right below me. I got you, I shouted breathlessly. Someone, probably Shantanu, groaned. I rolled off the pile and onto the hard ground laughing, asking if they knew where Mohan was when I saw legs come towards me. I sat up, squinting at the guard, aware my white kurta was smeared liberally with dirt and grass and my hair was falling from its braids. But only half embarrassed. You just get up, I hissed. You too, the guard said, nodding his chin towards a group of us. The Raja would like to speak with you immediately. I rose to my feet. We can play later, I said to my brothers. You two go, I'll find Mohan. I had started to walk away when the guard called. Yuvradni Kaikei, the Raja wants you now. I turned to look at Yudajit, shocked. He only shrugged at me. We trailed behind the guard, back to the palace, and each of my steps felt heavier than the last. Something had to be amiss for my father to summon me. But if I had done something to anger him, why would he want Yudajit too? As we approached the throne room, I dragged my feet against the stone, letting the guard and Yudajit get farther and farther ahead. At the end of the hall, the guard turned and glared, waiting by the closed doors until I reached him, then swinging it open in a precise movement. 
Yutajit went in first and I lingered a few seconds longer before following into the flickering light of the hall. He half turned his head as I approached and the light cast strange shadows on his wide forehead and narrow nose. His dark brown eyes held a flicker of apprehension and his lips were pressed into a thin line in what I was sure was an eerie rendering of my own face. I took my place a pace behind him and glanced surreptitiously around the room, afraid of attracting attention. During feasts, the high ceiling room was filled with rows of tables and throngs of people, and its cavernous depths did not seem large at all. Absent these preparations, the wooden pillars cast long shadows, the carvings of bulls and snakes and long-plumed birds that so entertained my younger brothers fading into the room. The huge crackling fire pits built partially to warm the entire hall when the weather turned in the winter and partially I suspected to intimidate visitors made me feel even smaller than I usually did. My father's throne was carved out of dark wood into stark undecorated lines, much like the man who sat upon it. My hand stroked his beard as he stared unwaveringly into the nearest pit his thick eyebrows deeply furrowed. Despite the warmth of the flames, goose flesh crawled up my skin and I tried not to shiver. After several minutes, Yutajit, with all the patience of a 12-year-old boy, blurted out, Why did you call us here if you wanted to sit there and say nothing? Raja Ashwapati looked up at him as if he had not realized we were there. He did not spare so much as a glance for me, hidden behind my brother. Your mother he began. I glanced around the room looking for her, but she was nowhere to be found. She would not have added much warmth to the room, but she was rarely cold the way father was. Father opened his mouth, closed it, opened it again, then said, your mother had to leave. She will not return. At that, Yudhajit laughed and I winced. I wished we had learned this news from the guards without father present, so I could tell him it was not a prank. Had he not seen how distant our parents were towards each other, how quick to snap they were, how the edges of their relationship were fraying? But my brother, the brilliant heir, said, We are too old for you to joke with us this way, father. Mother is Radni. A queen wouldn't just leave. Kekaya is no longer Radni, father said, and his eyes sought me out for the first time. Why? What? Yutajit's shoulders drooped. Who will... He trailed off, apparently unable to describe what our mother actually did. Our father sighed. As the Yuvradni, Kaikei will slowly assume some of the duties of the queenship until you are old enough to wed. I bit down on my tongue. The metallic taste of blood filled my mouth and I swallowed before it could stain my teeth. I had no idea how to take on any of my mother's responsibilities, nor did I have any desire to. Yutajit took my hand and squeezed it. Surely mother will come back, he said. She would not just leave us like that. The Raja shook his head. She told me she would never return. Kekeya is no longer welcome here. And just like that, we were dismissed. In the hall, Yudhajit tried to speak to me, but I brushed him aside and raced back to my room, slamming the door behind me and falling to my knees. I knew what I needed to do. Please, I prayed to the God, those who watched over the land of Bharat, please help me. I invoked Chandra, the god of the moon, Nasatya, the god of twins, and Kubera, the god of the north. Please bring my mother back. Please grant me the knowledge I need in her absence. There was no reply. The gods always answered the prayers of princesses. My tutors liked to tell me, for princesses were the most devout and holiest of all. But whether it be for rains or sunshine, for strength or knowledge, for new toys or clothes, they had never answered a single prayer of mine. Yutajit, it seemed, had stolen all the good fortune of our birth for himself, leaving me bereft of any assistance at all. But now surely they would answer, They would understand that a girl needed her mother. Who else would show me how to make my way through this world? Without her, I was alone. Kekea did not act towards her children the way other noble women at court did. 
she never kissed my scrapes or helped me when i cried after fighting with yudhajit never cuddled me before i went to bed at night instead she taught me how to read drawing the characters in a pan of sand and repeating them with me 10 times and 10 more times until i knew them by heart and even then she did not praise me but she gave me scrolls and listened as i picked out stories my favorite was a churning of the ocean that wondrous tale of the gods and the asuras together churning the ocean of milk seeking in its depth the nectar of immortality the nectar must have been unimaginably delicious for them to form such an alliance i could understand for i loved sweets too as they churned they split between them the spoils that emerged from the ocean a tree twisted like the claws of a tiger with sharp red flowers that could draw blood and grant boons wise and powerful goddesses including lakshmi seated on a pale pink lotus her hair dripping gold even the moon itself a luminescent pearl caught among the waves and at last they found the treasure they sought but the gods did not wish to share the nectar with the asuras for this demonic race had long terrorized the earth and heavens with their lust for power they were the only beings with the power to rival the gods and the two were often at war and so the great vishnu tricked the asuras out of the share they had been promised but how could the gods lie when they are good i asked my mother puzzled the gods do what they must she said but she gave me a smile and i felt clever when i had finished the legends she took me alone through the maze of palace corridors and through a polished door of teak set into the floor with a great glinting silver handle together we descended into the library cellar filled floor to ceiling with precious texts and dusty scrolls and this felt like the greatest compliment of all it was because of her i loved reading consuming even the dullest treatises in my quest to learn all i could i had often doubted whether she even liked me her only daughter but now my heart clenched oddly at the thought of losing her presence i felt as though i could not breathe deeply enough i did not cry i continued to beseech the gods even as the chamber grew dark around me my knees stiff and aching from my seated position on the floor finally mantra came to comb my hair and put me to bed i was relieved to see her at least i would not lose her too would you like to hear a story she asked smiling at me in the mirror i have a new one for you i shook my head crossing my arms normally i would beg her for songs or tales and she would comply until my eyes grew heavy and images of splendid feats danced beneath my eyelids but tonight i said nothing at all kai ke i know you must be upset but I slipped out of my chair, my hair half braided and flung myself onto the bed. Mantra could not bring my mother back. She did not understand how this felt. I had been relieved to see her, but now all I wanted was to be left alone until I could go find Yutajit. I could not take her sympathy and I hoped if I was rude to her she might leave, but Mantra simply stood and came to sit at my bedside. I turned away from her. and still she only clucked her tongue one hand rubbing gentle circles into my back all will be well she said before bending down to press a kiss on the back of my head my eyes filled with tears so i clenched them shut refusing to turn my head eventually she rose and blew out the candle closing the door very quietly behind her seconds passed into minutes and continued to lie there waiting until the quiet of the night had fully descended and i could safely leave finally breathlessly i opened my door slowly and checked both ways then padded down the hallway on bare feet there were no torches and the dark gray stone turned nearly black at this hour the moonlight barely filtering in through the few windows lining the corridor The low ceiling seemed to bear down on me with every step but I was intent on my task. Kaike? My heart stopped for one agonizing moment. I pressed myself against the wall as it restarted at double speed. It was only my brother whom I had ventured to find in the first place. Yutajit? 
He was a few steps away, clad in a crisp white cotton sleep clothes that had clearly not been slept in. His eyes shone brightly in the darkness. He too must have been waiting for the still hour to leave his room. What are you doing up? he asked. What are you doing up? I retorted, not wanting to admit that I had been coming to get him. He made a face. I asked you first. I shrugged and started walking away, trying to feign indifference. The court had taught me patience, but it had taught Yutajit impulsivity. Only one of us knew how to hold their tongue. I couldn't sleep. I miss mother. She did not even say goodbye to us. I, I don't understand. His voice twisted and broke and I found myself fighting back tears as well. Unwilling to face my own grief, I kept walking and he easily caught up to me, filling the space by my side, as he always did. We slipped like ghosts through the hallways, not wanting to return to bed just yet. In unspoken agreement, we found ourselves heading towards the doors to the kitchen, our stomachs growling in unison. Yutajit moved ahead to open the door. I had grown distracted thinking of what sweets I might find to snack on and did not realize he had stopped until I walked right into him. He stumbled slightly but did not make a sound, pointing his chin towards the entrance. After a moment, I heard what he did, the faintest murmur of voices. We tiptoed closer, closer, closer until the murmurs became words. So long as nobody learns the truth, it does not matter. I could not recognize the deep voice resonating through the small space like the beat of an animal high drum. Yutajit, more familiar with the men of the palace, mouthed Prasad at me. An advisor who I had seen at formal court occasions, but he nev- never interacted with me. He sat near the king, so my father likely valued him. The second voice I recognized immediately. It belonged to my mother's former lady-in-waiting, Danteri. It matters to me, she said sharply. It shouldn't, Prasad replied. I know. Mantra knows. Why keep it a secret? The children deserve to know. Neither of you can tell another soul or both of you will find yourself unable to work. Dantiri laughed, a sound without any happiness. I am already without work. The Raja saw to that when he banished Rajni Kekaya. If our bodies had not been nearly occupying the same space, I would not have noticed Yutajit's quiet gasp. Banished. I was listening, straining for answers, as though by will alone I could force these adults to tell me what I craved to know. Woman, she is not your Radni anymore. You will not speak another word or I will ensure that you are the last of your name. Prasad hissed. His tone frightened me. I snuck a glance at Yutajit to see if perhaps he understood what that threat meant. But he looked as confused as I did. If you keep your mouth shut, Prasad added, I will see to it that you are kept on to manage the women's work in the court. There was silence for a moment. As you say, Arya Prasad, the faintest rustle of clothes came from behind the door. I will speak to Mantra. See that you do. So long as everyone believes Radni Kaikaya left of her own accord, it will not matter what really happened. Yutajit and I backed away from the door as one, rounding the corner slowly, carefully. But when we were sure we were not to be heard, we darted fast, bare feet leaving brief impressions of dampness against the cool stone. Only when we reached our rooms did we stop, facing each other and panting. What do we do? Yutajit asked. Surely they could not have been telling the truth. There's nothing we can do, I said. We can talk to father. No, I cut him off. Please, we cannot tell anyone. You heard what Prasad said. If you tell anyone, Mantra will have to leave. I couldn't stomach the thought. You shouldn't need your nurse anymore, Kaikei. We are twelve, almost adults. Yutajit scoffed. He had only recently become taller than me. I hated his new height and the way he could look down upon me now. But I hated even more that he was right. Still, I will not give up Mantra. Please, I asked. He held my gaze for a moment, then sighed and nodded. Perhaps we can pray to the gods to change father's mind, he said. I shook my head at him. The gods cannot force someone to change their mind. You know how father is. He has made this decision and it will be final. 
Yudhajit's shoulders slumped. I suppose. They stood there together in silence for several moments more. Until I yawned, the energy that had pushed me out of bed and through the halls finally draining out of me. Yudhajit caught my yawn and we both grinned at each other. Even so, when I went back into my room and climbed into bed, sleep evaded me. I stared up at the ceiling, wondering what gods my family might have displeased to have such misfortune.